This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Selling a little or a lot? Do your thing however you cha-ching with Shopify, the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout. 36% better on average compared to other leading commerce platforms. Get a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash offer 23. Tis the season to shine with H&M. Discover the holiday collection and find fashionable pieces for your wardrobe or for under the tree. Get inspired and dazzle with this year's glam from tuxedo styles, bow detailed pieces, impressive prints, and more. From unforgettable looks to unforgettable gifts. With fashion finds to home decor, find it all at H&M. Treat your loved ones and yourself this season. Shop in-store or at hm.com. Slow Burn Media and Evergreen Podcast presents Who Killed? A podcast that provides a voice for the voiceless. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Who Killed? The Presser of the Week. I'm your host, Bill Huffman, and this is a Slow Burn Media, Evergreen Podcasts, and Killer Podcasts production. This week, we are going to the great state of Texas for a press conference on the shooting spree that took place earlier this week. As with all these episodes, these are real tragedies with real people whose lives have been changed forever due to the actions of this one spree shooter. According to KXAN, Shane James, 34, is the suspect in a series of shootings that killed six people and wounded three others in Austin, and this is according to the Austin police. He was arrested early Wednesday morning and charged with the capital murder of multiple people, and that is according to Travis County jail records. A law enforcement source told KXAN Wednesday that James does not seem to have any link to the victims in Austin and that the violent incidents appear to be random. The source of the investigation is ongoing. Among the injured were an Austin Independent School District officer and an Austin police officer who both suffered non-life-threatening injuries. According to Interim Chief Robert Robin Henderson, the suspect is allegedly responsible for multiple shootings in Austin and San Antonio on Tuesday. The first incident occurred on Shadywood Drive in South Austin, where two people were killed. The second incident involved shooting an AISD officer at Northeast Early College High School. The third incident took place on Austral Loop in the Circle C neighborhood, where Two more people, Catherine and Lauren Short, were fatally shot and an APD officer was wounded. The suspect also shot and injured a cyclist on West Slaughter Lane. In addition, the Bexar County Sheriff's Office confirmed that a suspected double homicide near San Antonio is likely linked to the same suspect. Chief Henderson provided the following timeline of events during this press conference that you will hear. So at 10.48 a.m., Austin ISD officer was shot near Northeast Early College High School. At 11.59 a.m., there was the double homicide on Shadywood Drive. About a quarter to six, the cyclist was shot on West Slaughter Lane. At 6.55, uh, APD officers respond to an active burglary, and they find the suspect in the backyard. The suspect fires at officers, and the suspect drives away. At 7.15 p.m., the police chase ends with the suspect crashing his car. Now, again, there was a person on a bike that was injured by gunfire on West Slaughter Lane, as I mentioned. The incident happened around 5.45. The identity of the 39-year-old man who was injured in the shooting incident on Wednesday was not disclosed by police. The man was taken to the hospital for treatment and is in stable condition. Chief Henderson reported that an officer discovered the burglary suspect in the backyard of a Circle C home on Austral Loop. The officer arrived at the scene around 7 p.m. after receiving a call about the break-in. The affidavit stated that the caller was watching his home security system live and saw a man breaking into his house where his wife and daughter with special needs were. Officers arrived and found the suspect inside the house trying to escape from the back, the affidavit said. James fired at an officer and hit him several times. The officer returned fire but missed the suspect. The affidavit states that James broke into a house on 
Austral Loop and killed two women. That would have been Catherine Short and Lauren Short before taking their car from the garage and escaping. Police responded to the scene and one officer was again shot by James during the pursuit. The officer was taken to the hospital with non-life-threatening injuries and has since been discharged. James was eventually arrested and charged with capital murder and aggravated assault on a public servant. According to the police, an officer involved shooting is under investigation and more information will be shared within 10 business days as per APD protocol. The police pursued the suspect until he collided with another vehicle at the junction of State Highway 45 and FM 1826. The affidavit stated that the suspect reached speeds up to 90 miles per hour before crashing. A homicide investigation is underway in South Austin after a man and woman were found dead on Shadywood Drive on Tuesday around noon, and that is according to the Austin Police Department. The victims identified are as Emmanuel Pop Ba, 32, and Sabrina Rahman, 24. They had visible injuries on their bodies, and this was according to APD Sergeant Destiny Silva. The incident occurred in the neighborhood east of South 1st Street and south of West William Cannon Drive. Police said Ba and Rahman were both fatally shot at the scene. Ba died on the spot while Rahman was rushed to a nearby hospital where she succumbed to her injuries. And the suspect in the shooting rampage that killed four people and injured two others may have also murdered his parents in Bexar County near San Antonio, and that is according to the Bexar County Sheriff's Office. They said in a press conference that they have evidence linking the suspect to the double homicide that occurred in the same county. Now let's listen to the press conference from the Bexar County Sheriff's Office. Okay. Well, good afternoon. I'm, I'm Sheriff Javier Salazar. I know most of our local media knows who we are, but I know we've got national folks here. So my name is Sheriff Javier Salazar. I'm the Bear County Sheriff. Uh, next to me is District, Att District Attorney Joe Gonzalez uh, from the Bear County DA's office. Uh, we're, gonna, we're here to provide some details uh, to the best that we know right now uh, regarding a shooting incident that happened last night. Uh, so what I'll be talking about is obviously I will be giving tentative details on who the victims are. We don't have a definitive identification at this point, uh, but we're, we're, we're fairly certain who, who these folks are. So we'll be identifying them, and we'll also be identifying uh, the suspect in the case who is currently in custody and is remanded without bond in Travis County on, a, on the, the part of the incident that happened there in Travis County. Now, while I won't be speaking in great detail about what happened in Travis County, because I still don't know full details, of, of course, we have been in communications with the Austin Police Department. I know our district attorney has been talking to the DA there in Travis County, and I'll let him uh, discuss that. I will be talking about the timeline of events that, as we know them here in Bear County, and I will be asking for the public's help with certain details on that. I will also be prepared to talk about a timeline of events, again, as we know them, of our dealings with this suspect to this, to this point. Uh, and so let me begin by, by just telling you who the victims are in this case that we're talking about, if we can bring those up on, on the stage. Tentatively ID'd, we've got Phyllis James, 55 years of age, and Shane M. James Sr., he's 56 years of age. These are believed to be the parents of the suspect that's currently in custody in Travis County, uh, and his name is Shane M. James Jr. Um, he's 34 years of age. Do we have a picture of him? That's the suspect there. Uh, again, here currently we are working on warrants uh, to, to, to file on him. The only current charges that he has are the uh, whatever charges Austin PD has him in custody on there in the Travis County Jail and then plus three misdemeanor warrants from here in Bear County. So here's what we know of the timeline here. Uh, the last time we have a report that somebody spoke to one of these victims was at around 10 p.m. the night of the 4th. Uh, uh, the sibling of one of the, of the suspect, one of the, his siblings, spoke to one of the victims about 10 p.m., give or take, the night prior. The next thing that we have on our timeline, as far as that goes, is the next morning at 9, one of the neighbors woke up, saw that the, that the, the father's vehicle was not in the driveway, which he found odd, for whatever reason. He assumed that, for some, again, for some reason, he assumed that the son must have the vehicle and, and is gone somewhere in the dad's car. So the best that we can put together 
Uh, possible time of death is sometime between 10 p.m. that night and 9 a.m. that next morning. Here's where I'll be asking the public for assistance. Uh, so while we don't know exactly where during that time frame uh, these, these victims were killed, uh, we're asking the public that if you live in that neighborhood, please uh, make it a point to check your doorbell camera video. In a bit, we're going to be showing a picture of the suspect's vehicle, what he went to Austin in. That car is currently in our custody. But what we're going to be asking is neighbors to check, did you see this car on a doorbell camera sometime between 10 p.m. and 9 a.m.? Um, did you hear what you thought may have been gunshots, but you wrote it off at the time, but now we know that there was a, a double shooting that happened with several gunshots fired uh, from, from what we're able to determine a, a large caliber handgun. Um, so we're, again, asking the public to reach out to us, 210-335-6000. You can also email us at bcsotips at bear.org. Uh, but we are asking for any information that you have. Again, and I'll, I'll use this as an opportunity to remind you, if what you feel is just a puzzle piece that's this big, it may be just that one puzzle piece that we need to break this case wide open for us. So please, call us no matter how insignificant you, you feel your information might be. Please, it's important that you call us. Again, 210-335-6000 or bcsotips at bear.org. Likewise, if you live between here and Austin and you feel like you had seen, and we'll, we'll show his video, his picture again in a few, but we're also going to show uh, the suspect vehicle. Let's, let's go ahead and bring out the picture of that suspect vehicle. This is the suspect's car. Is that the exact color, Johnny, or is that, is that a different? Okay, so that's the exact color of the suspect's car. Uh, we are uh, asking, again, anybody that may have possibly run into this suspect in this car at a gas station between here and Austin. Again, we're trying to determine a timeline, and so we're asking anybody that may have seen that vehicle uh, to please give us a call, 210-335-6000 or bcsotips at bear.org. Um, so with regard to the shooting itself, uh, the first time we became aware was around 745 last night. We got a call from Austin PD saying that they had a suspect in custody there uh, in Austin uh, for several shootings. To now, I still don't know the number of victims that, that were uh, actually shot in Austin. I know there were some civilians that, 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 that died as a result of the shooting. Of the shooting. Uh, and I know that there were some law enforcement officers that were wounded. Uh, I believe they have all survived their injuries. But that's really the extent of what I know about what occurred in Austin. Uh, I'm sure my homicide folks know more, but that's, that's what I know at this point. They called us at about 745 and said they had this suspect in custody in Austin. And could we please check a location here in, in Bear County that is associated with him, his residence? Uh, we had deputies go there to the residence, <clears throat> and uh, they knocked on the door. They uh, saw water coming out from under the, the door, and which obviously struck them as strange. They then got clearance from their supervisor to force entry to the residence under exigent circumstances, believing somebody may be injured inside the home. Um, and as it turns out, that's exactly the case. Uh, I was actually monitoring the radio at the time that they made entry to the home. Uh, they, you could hear them going through the home saying, we're clearing this bedroom, we're clearing this room now. At a certain point in there, you hear the deputies say, we have a crime scene, or words to that effect. So it was obvious at that point they found uh, blood and or the, the victim's uh, deceased in a small room located in the, uh, in the house itself. Um, once they realized that what we were dealing with was, was most likely a, a double homicide, they then notified CID and, and we came to the location and began processing the scene. Uh, they spent the better part of the night and, and early into this morning uh, processing that scene. Uh, they, they've gathered all the evidence that they could. We cleared the scene at about 5 o'clock this morning, thereabouts, maybe way between 4 and 5 o'clock this morning, turned the house over, back over to the, uh, the next of kin, and came back and, and started processing the scene. Uh, the, um, again, our intention at this point is to eventually, uh, and I'm talking about here in the next day, maybe the next day or two, uh, charge this suspect here in Bear County with either murder or capital murder, uh, based upon what the uh, facts of the case as we know them at that time, what that can support. Obviously, we would, I would hope for the higher charge, but is it, do we have enough elements of the offense met that will support capital murder? Uh, so that determination will be made very sooner rather than later, and we will be charging him. Now, I can tell you, at this point, we uh, are hopeful, 
Well, I can tell you that the, the DAs have been working, uh, and I'll, I'll let Mr. Gonzalez address that uh, more in depth, but I can tell you that the DAs have been working behind the scenes to where we're certain that this suspect is not going to get out of jail. The reason, obviously, that that, that that allows us to take our time is then we can put together the best case possible before we go to the magistrate and say, hey, we want uh, an arrest warrant and here's what we're looking for. It allows my investigators time to meticulously go through all the evidence and then present the best case they possibly can uh, to the magistrate trying to get an arrest warrant. Uh, and so that's, that's what we know to this point. Uh, what I can tell you about the timeline of events as we know them, if we, as that we are dealings with this suspect. Uh, January 6th of 2022, he was arrested uh, there in the 6,000 block of Port Royal for three misdemeanor charges of, of assault. Uh, we believe that the victims of those assaults at that time were the two decedents, the two victims that were deceased, and then a sibling. Uh, he was arrested on that day, on January 6th, 2022, by deputies from the Bear County Sheriff's Office. Uh, he was booked into the jail on January 7th. Uh, on January 14th, uh, a victim's advocate from the sheriff's office, in keeping in protocol with what we do with domestic violence cases, reached out to the family. The family stated that James does not belong in jail. He has mental health issues. Um, at some point uh, in, during that time, I believe around January 27th of 2022, the conditions of his bond were altered. I don't, I'm not exactly sure why. But I, I, can, I can speculate a bit if you'll, if you'll allow me to, to detail what I know of those bond conditions. Initially, when he was booked on January 7th, he was booked uh, for, uh, with the bond, he was, yeah, he had the bond conditions on his charge of no contact whatsoever with the victims, January 7th. Uh, on January 27th, the bond changed to no um, threatening, harmful contact with the, with the victims in the case. Again, I'm speculating, but I believe it, it, that may have been done at the request of the family members that said, hey, he, he, he's got nowhere else to go but home. We can't deal with those uh, bond conditions. We, we need them relaxed a bit. So they were relaxed a bit January 27th to no harmful contact with the victims. Um, March 7th, he was released from jail. On March 8th, uh, now we now know that he cut off his ankle monitor. Uh, and those, those three charges then became warrants for his arrest. Um, at that point in, in time, it's interesting to note, it was not, not actually a criminal offense to cut off an ankle monitor uh, during that time, at that time. It became a criminal offense this past September to cut off your ankle monitor. So while it was a violation of your probation or your, your bond to cut off an ankle monitor back then, it was not actually a standalone crime. <clears throat> Now it is actually a standalone crime, and I believe it's a felony offense to do so. So, uh, and, and our processes have changed since then to where now we, if somebody cuts off an ankle monitor, uh, the sheriff's office and or the, follow, the, the handling agency of whatever the offense is, get an email from pretrial saying, this suspect on your case just cut off an ankle monitor, and then we can proceed with, with filing the appropriate criminal felony charges and going and picking him up. Regardless, back in March, March of 2022, unfortunately, that, that statute did not exist. On March 9th, those warrants were reissued for arrest due to violation of the bond. This past August, uh, our deputies received a call to that location for a mental health episode. When deputies arrived, they realized that the suspect had three uh, outstanding warrants, misdemeanor warrants for his arrest. And when they met uh, the complainant at that time, uh, Shane Sr. in the front yard, they advised him at that time, uh, you know, he's telling them the story of what's going on with his son. Uh, to paraphrase what I remember of the case, he was naked, he was, uh, he was just uh, acting out, had a mental health episode, and he was upstairs in his bedroom. Uh, deputies advised the, the, the dad at that time that he had three warrants for his arrest, and the dad said words to the effect of, oh, for that last thing? Uh, yes. And then he says, man, he was there for a long time. Or again, words to that effect. While, uh, and so the, the deputies indicated, well, he's going to have to come with us. If we can get him, he's going to have to come with us. And so then all of them went upstairs. Uh, the deputies then went to the bedroom. They knocked. The door was locked. They were not able to get in. Uh, being that there were misdemeanor warrants, our, um, our authority to force entry to somebody's domicile is somewhat limited because it's a, it's a misdemeanor warrant at that time. So the deputies were not able to force the door in, but the dad did, and he, and he did. And, and he's seen on body camera video uh, 
putting his shoulder into the door and opening it by force, but the door only opened so much. So uh, there, was a there was a bed there. And then the deputies, once they looked in, and you can see what they see by the body cam, the suspect is laying on the bed, and he's clearly naked. Uh, and then at, at a certain point, the deputies start speaking to him through the crack in the door, which is about eh, four inches. And the suspect then goes behind the door. Uh, the deputies are talking to him through the door, asking him to come out. They're trying to bring him down, trying to de-escalate. The suspect is, is upset during that time. And the deputies, you can, you can tell that they know what they're doing with regard to de-escalation. They're talking to him in calm, a calm tone. He is being insulting to them, but not threatening. In other words, he's, he's hurling racial slurs at them and then questioning their, uh, their, their uh, sexual orientation, I guess. Uh, based on, he's using terms to question their sexual orientation. The deputies are unfazed. They're professionals. They're doing what they need to do. But again, they're not able to get into the room itself or get, physically get hands on the, on the suspect. They're not able to talk him out of the room. At a certain point, they all go back downstairs and start talking to the dad again and tell the dad that, um, you know, we're, we're going to leave him here, but we're not going to be gone far. We're going to be up the street. If you will please call us back if and when he comes out of that bedroom, and we'll come right back and we'll arrest him. As, by all appearances, it doesn't appear like that call ever came in. The dad indicated that, yes, he would, and then, and then by all indications, we never got another call. We did not get another call back to this residence until such time as we got as we got the call last last night at about 7:45 uh, p.m. And so that's the that's the the gist of this case as I understand it to this point. Let me just do a, a quicker condensed version of that in Spanish, and then I'll open it up to whatever questions you might have for me or for the district attorney. Uh, anoche, como ustedes saben, nosotros uh, fuimos a una casa. Uh, en el este del condado por un reporte, o por, para checar unas personas que, unos residentes de la casa. Se aparenta que el, el departamento de policías de Austin, uh, ellos arrestaron a un sospechoso por un, varios tiroteos que ocurrieron en la ciudad de Austin anoche. A nosotros nos llamaron aproximadamente a las 7.45 de la noche pidiéndonos que nosotros checáramos la casa donde vivía el sospechoso. Cuando nosotros llegamos, encontramos dos víctimas, se supone, de, de, de homicidios. Uh, se aparenta que, que parece que el sospechoso uh, valió las dos, las dos víctimas la noche anterior o la mañana, en, en la mañana ayer, uh, entre las horas de las 10 de la mañana y 9 de la mañana, uh, 10 de la noche y 9 de la mañana, algo pasó durante ese tiempo donde nosotros pensamos que el sospechoso mató a las víctimas y él huyó a Austin, donde empezó a hacer lo que hizo allá en Austin. Uh, nosotros sabemos que este sospechoso, sabemos quién es. Uh, nosotros ahorita, el intento de nosotros es uh, aplicar por una, dos, dos órdenes de arresto para el sospechoso tocante lo que, lo que, les pasó, lo que pasó aquí en el condado de Bejar. Se sabe que él todavía está en la cárcel en, en el condado de Travis y no se va a salir. Entonces eso, no, eso nos deja a nosotros trabajar en el caso y luego ya vamos a aplicar con el juez por una, una orden de, de arresto y ojalá le ponemos ca más cargos ya cuando se llegue a ese punto. Este sospechoso ya sabemos que nosotros lo, lo hemos arrestado antes por uh, casos menores de uh, violencia doméstica, tres casos y se aparenta que él ha estado, uh, estaba en la cárcel por un tiempo, pero ya se salió de la cárcel. Él tenía una pulsera puesta, se la cortó hace, uh, más que un año, hace más que un año. Y unos, hace unos cuantos meses nuestros oficiales fueron a la casa de él por, por una llamada que él estaba en crisis mental. Uh, en ese día no, no lograron arrestarlo, sino que uh, dejaron... Uh, uh, Aviso con la familia que por favor nos hablaran ya con no, no, podíamos arrestarlo. Esa llamada nun, nunca vino y ya sabemos que la próxima vez que, ve, que fuimos a la casa de él uh, fue anoche cuando nos encontramos con las, las víctimas. Any questions? Yes, sir. With all the contacts that you had with James, mm -hmm. could you have done more to keep him off the street? Well, Jay, it's always possible that we could have done more. And, and absolutely, while, while we wish that the opportunity had presented itself on that day to put hands on him, there is no doubt in my mind the deputies would have absolutely had they been able to safely put hands on him. But I can also see, and again, I'm speculating here based upon what I, what I know of the training my deputies go through and, and what I saw them 
speaking to them as the professionals that they are, they, they, it appears they were making every effort to avoid a violent confrontation with what they could tell was an unarmed man uh, in the nude. Uh, that is a no-win situation for them should they uh, be accused of uh, inciting a violent confrontation with this man. I think they, they made the intent to try to de-escalate. When that failed, they left the location, again, in hopes of coming back. But for that time, they wanted, it appears to me they wanted to avoid a violent confrontation. So absolutely, I wish we could have been able to get him in custody. Now, with that being said, it's assuming a lot, saying had they just arrested him that day, this wouldn't have happened. There are misdemeanor charges. Uh, to hear the DA, uh, the assistant DA that I spoke to say it, chances are he would have already t served his time and been out by this time anyway, ha even had we put him in custody in August. Regardless, I, I do. I wish there was more that the system could do for suspects like like this like this man, uh, he, it appears by all accounts he's suffered with mental illness for some years. Uh, from what the family members are telling us, he's had uh, mental health issues for some years. Based upon some of the history that we've seen, he was in the military for some time, was discharged uh, due to some sort of a domestic violence incident in the in the in the military. Uh, again, I, I think that's in no small part due to his mental illness. So absolutely, I wish there's more we, the system would do for a person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mira, en cada caso que nosotros hacemos nuestro trabajo, uno nos puede atacar. Si no queremos hacer eso, entonces, ¿para qué hacer este trabajo? Con eso, uh, mi trabajo es hacer, proteger nuestra comunidad. Es lo que estos oficiales intentar, intentaron hacer. Uh, la persona que se debería uh, echar la culpa en este caso este es, es el sospechoso este. Aunque tenía él uh, problemas mentales, Uh, también eh, no sabemos cómo se juntó él con una arma. Nosotros no le, pusimos, no le pusimos esa arma en las manos, sino que nosotros ahorita quisiéramos averiguar quién le, quién, quién le, do, le dio acceso a las armas, porque su condición de él era que no de, debería tener armas, pero con eso pasó. También sabemos que el, el hombre este desafortunadamente no estaba tomando sus medicinas, y que estaba tomando uh, cuando, en, los, en los días anteriores de esto, que estaba tomando, también eso fue a, a alguna condición. Este hombre, aunque tiene problemas, problemas uh, físicas o uh, mentales, es adulto. Él, él, de, él también sabe lo que debería estar haciendo y no estar haciendo. Entonces, la culpa es de él. Nosotros, a nosotros nos toca poder averiguar uh, si, si se puede, si, cómo se deberían hacer las, las, las cosas y cómo aprender de esta situación para prevenir otras tragedias en el, en el futuro. Y es lo que estamos haciendo ahorita. Tia González, um, I know it was last year, but um, James was bonded out by Texas Organizing Project, which has worked with the county to reduce the population at the jail. Uh, they've also contributed to your um, election campaign and to the sheriff's. And uh, they bonded them out on those assault charges after bond was reduced. Uh, do either of you uh, regret that partnership with Texas Organizing Project? Well, look, uh, Texas Organizing Project was one group that supported me during my campaign. But my office nor, nor I have anything to do with their activities. Uh, in deciding who to bond out, but I will tell you that the decision that they made uh, that they made to bond these individuals out was based on on their review of the case. We're talking about someone that was charged uh, with a Class A misdemeanor assault, where the the allegation is a pushing and a scratching. Uh, there is there was no criminal history of this individual, so uh, as bonds go and as uh, risk goes, this was a low risk. Uh, Uh, to that organization and, and, uh, and I suppose to the judge in, in determining where the bond is. And I will repeat that the, the district attorney's office does not set bonds. We, we recommend bonds. Uh, it's up to the magistrate judge uh, to, to set a bond. But I would say that based on the information that the magistrate judge had at the time and then the, the county court judge, that the bonds at, the, uh, at that moment were uh, appropriate. And so we're talking about three $100 bonds. So when you talk about any organization, whether it's top or commercial bondsman or an individual, 
Uh, again, uh, these were uh, low bonds. Sure, but they were reduced. Can, can you, can you well, just, uh, I understand, but uh, they were reduced uh, by, by the judge, uh, and so he reduced it from $500 to, to $100. And, and so those, were, those bonds were, were then uh, the bonds that were, that, were bond, uh, that the organization bonded the defendant out with. But, but if, if, the, if, the point, if the question is whether or not um, that organization should have done that, again, that's a question you're going to have to ask them because I didn't have anything to do with that. Uh, that's that's uh, something you'd have to address Do with them. Do you plan to pay that money back or donate that amount to charity, things that politicians have done in the past where organizations that have helped fund them or supported them have then been involved mm -hmm. in a, a situation like this? Well, we're getting off topic here, but I will tell you this, Dylan. Their, their top has never given me one cent. They, they, they provided a service. Uh, that they had to put a dollar amount on. Well, let me finish. Let me, yeah, if I could finish, please. Yeah, I mean, uh, and so there's there's no there, there's there's no uh, money amount uh, that they donated to me. And, and so uh, and and I'm going to go forward with my uh, with my office uh, and and do the right thing because public safety is is our number one concern. And so we're going to continue to do what we're doing now, which is uh, focus on public safety. You know, with, with, um, with a multiply, multiple uh, jurisdictions, can you just give me a sense about what the process will be? Who will be, I mean, will it be charged first in Austin or Bear County? Uh, give me a sense. Of well, uh, let me tell you, first of all, uh, it's unfortunate that we have to be uh, here at this press conference. Uh, we, we hope to never have to do this, but but uh, what is what is uh, positive about this thing is that these agencies have come together as soon as as we have. Uh, I thank the sheriff for inviting me to be part of this because we usually don't get involved until a case is investigated and filed in our office. But I will tell you that there are already uh, uh, agencies that are being proactive. I spoke this morning with the district attorney in Travis County. I spoke to the U.S. Attorney's Office. I spoke to the actual U.S. Attorney and uh, has offered his. Uh, his resources and his help. So that's uh, that's a positive thing that we're going to be working together. I will tell you uh, that uh, this man is um, in the custody of Travis County. I don't expect that he will be released uh, to us uh, to prosecute uh, this case when it's filed until they resolve their case. But I will tell you that uh, we're already taking steps to ensure that this man doesn't get out in the public. Uh, today, we filed motions to remand without bond on these misdemeanor cases, and the judge granted that. So if he, when he comes to Bear County, he's not stepping foot outside uh, the jail door. But again, we have to wait patiently until Travis County uh, finishes their prosecution on this case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Eh, aunque pare dinero, ¿qué, ¿qué es lo que va a pasar? Hemos, hemos pedido al juez que, que detengan a esta persona sin, sin una fianza y, y el, el juez nos, nos dio esa, esa, esa petición, pero vamos a tener que esperar hasta que se, se, se resuelva ese caso en el otro condado en uh, Austin uh, antes que nosotros podamos proceder en contra de esta de este caso y, y ojalá que cuando presenten el caso va a ser de asesinato capital y vamos a hacer todo posible para proceder este, este, esta persona cuando ya lo dejen ir uh, desde Austin. ¿Buscar la pena de muerte? Vamos, todavía es, es temprano para hacer esa decisión, pero esa es una de las opciones, pero vamos a tener que esperar para eso. I'll turn it over to the sheriff. Let me answer your question, Jay. Uh, I don't regret any support from anybody in my campaign. Uh, they didn't do anything wrong in, su in supporting me. Uh, Dylan, Dylan, to answer your question, no, there's nothing for me to, to uh, refund. Uh, again, they didn't do anything wrong in, in helping this gentleman exercise his, his right to bond. Um, so, no, there, w there won't be any, anything refunded, and I don't regret anybody supporting me. Javier, can you tell us about the weapon and just how he got it? Was, he, was, was it legally purchased or anything in the background on that? So we're, we're trying to find out where that weapon came from. We're assuming it came from within the house. Uh, but, but beyond that, I don't know much about the weapon that he was caught with. What I can tell you at this point is that I believe the shell casings we found in the home do match at least some of the shell casings found in Austin. But beyond that, I don't know if they match the gun that he was caught with or if how many guns he was caught with. I don't have those details. 
cases are not actively available online because we had to call your office to confirm earlier that there were in fact <coughs> cases against him. And when I went up online at three ten at noon this afternoon, they were there. Well, if you're talking about the three misdemeanor cases filed in Bear County, they should be available because they're they're public, they're a matter of public record. Uh, and the public and uh, records are there, the, the hard copies, but online there is no record of his case. Okay, well I, that's a that's a function of of, of the county clerk and the the county uh, court system. Uh, I, I'll look into that to find out what they can do to make the. Uh, the information's available, but I will tell you that we have copies of, uh, and we can provide you hard copies because, as far as I'm concerned, they're a matter of public record. And, and while while you mention that, let me make sure everybody understands that the allegations in Bear County that we're talking about uh, are are of of having pushed or or scratched uh, the victims that have already been identified, which are uh, his parents and uh, and a sibling. And basically, the allegation is that the defendant. Uh, assaulted uh, uh, these three individuals on the same date out of the same transaction by pushing the complainant uh, and scratching. So uh, as these kind of offenses go, obviously we're not talking about an aggravated offense, we're not talking about uh, any weapons used, we're not talking about serious bodily injury, but it is a crime. It's a crime that we're going to hold him accountable for, it's a crime that we intend to prosecute. Uh, in due time, but again, he's about, got big, bigger pictures. I'm sorry, bigger problems now, uh, and that is the potential for a capital murder charge. But, but isn't there but, a rehabilitation process to this? If he had been rearrested after cutting off his ankle monitor and had gone to court for this and been given maybe mental health treatment or some sort of rehabilitative help, and maybe stop something like this from taking place, or are you of the belief that he was going to do something like this? Today? Well, sure, there's always a potential, and we hope that, that people can be rehabilitated, but you've got to get to court in order to, uh, to accept uh, rehabilitation. You have to uh, be able or be willing to resolve this case. The reality is he cut off his monitor, as you've heard the, the, uh, the sheriff say, and for almost two years, for that, that is over for a year and a half, uh, he was a fugitive from justice. He was on the lam, as they say, and so and unless we... Uh, we have him back in custody or we have him coming into the court. We can't resolve the case, and that's where we were with these cases. For over a year and a half, we couldn't get any resolution while he was in the wind. Uh, so we do hope that these individuals that are charged with crimes will come to court, will accept responsibility so that they can, uh, they can move on. Again, now we're dealing with a bigger uh, um, problem, but we will, uh, we will handle everything that we have uh, when it is filed uh, in due time. And just, and just so we're clear, prior to the, the uh, January 6th, he had no history of violence. That's correct. There was no indication, and again, you know, you talk about, you know, the, the factors that, that a judge uses to determine where to set a bond. There was no crystal ball. There was no indication. Other than, we know that, that there was uh, a mental health uh, history here. We know that there were, there were uh, 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 cases where there, uh, the police had to, uh, engage what we call emergency detention. So that was a red flag. But again, there was nothing uh, to indicate that this individual was going to commit uh, a murder and certainly not one of, of this uh, seriousness where you have multiple victims uh, and you have a capital murder that we have today. So we know now that there was a, mental, uh, there was a domestic violence incident of some sort in the military, but we, don't, I, we didn't know that on January 6th. I don't know that we would have had access to that. We know that now. But again, I don't know to what extent. I just know that that had something to do with why he left the military. Tell me what happened with what happened. And now, knowing what we know, will your officers proceed in a way that is different when they see cases very similar to this? Well, we don't know what we know. 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 Tienen que hacer todo lo posible para evitar uh, uh, encuentros físicos con alguien cuando no es necesario, absolutamente necesario. Es, es lo que se parece, parece que hicieron en esta, esta vez. Es, eh, desafortunadamente, desafortunadamente, ellos no podían ver en el futuro qué iba a pasar con este sospechoso, uh, aunque él, un, un, él no, ni sabía lo que iba a hacer en el, en el futuro. Para mí, los oficiales hicieron el, el trabajo que, que pudieron hacer ese día con la información que ellos tenían. Uh, desafortunadamente, ya sa ahorita sabemos que, que ocurrió una, una tragedia, pero no se sabe si 
uh, alguien hubiera, había pudi, uh, pues, uh, uh, podido evitar ese, esa tragedia? Me, gust, me gustaría que sí. I'm sorry? That I don't know that I can go into, if that's a HIPAA, HIPAA type uh, question. Uh, but what I can tell you is there, there is definitely a, a mental health aspect to this. There have been other episodes. Sorry, go ahead. Whenever y'all were aware that this, after there was a warrant um, and they were never contacted again by the family, did deputies ever try to go back to the house? What's the steps that they take when they know there's an active warrant there and they know where he lives? Well, when there's, uh, I mean, absolutely they're, they're able to, but do we, do, does the average patrol deputy who's running literally from call to call to call to call to call, have the time or do, do you all want them to, to camp out outside of a home for misdemeanor warrants that even if we get eyes on the guy, let's say we saw him through a window and we know he's in there. On a misdemeanor warrant, we don't have the authority to go kick in a door. If it were a felony warrant, absolutely. They've got the ability to go in and go after this person. But in this instance, these were misdemeanor warrants and we have very limited authorities on what we can do with those, unfortunately. Sheriff, you mentioned yes, a little bit earlier that when he was in the military, there's belief that part of the reason that he was no longer with the Army is because of a domestic violence incident that happened while he was with the military. Mm -hmm. Was that information provided to you all by the U.S. Army, or did you just now find that out as a result? Of no, we found that out today. And again, we don't have full access to it. All I've got, we've got some military paperwork with some entries. And in somewhere in there is the information that shows that it was a military, it was a uh, domestic incident of some sort that led to his discharge. But I don't know details, and we just found that out today. Is there the need for that communication, though? Because this is, if there is a reason for him to have potentially been dishonorably discharged for a domestic <clears throat> violence situation. Well, I mean, absolutely. Anytime that you're talking about more information, absolutely, more information is always better. Is it feasible from the military? I don't know. That'd be a question for them. Uh, is there a mechanism for us to take in this information in, in Military City USA where we just have tens of thousands of, of military veterans? Is it, is it feasible for us to take in that information and then store it somewhere on the off chance that maybe somebody will commit? I know that's not what you're saying. Absolutely. Inf more information is always better, but I don't know that, that it would have prevented anything in this instance. The last contact was August of this year. Yes. Him at the home. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, sir, well? you, I'm sorry. He had a follow-up question for me. I was going to say, so if that information had been provided to you all by the U.S. Army before today, mm -hmm. would that have changed? And maybe D.A. Gonzalez, this is another question for you. Would that have changed it from <clears throat> a misdemeanor to something else, knowing there had already been a history? I don't, I don't think it would have been, because it looks like it was in 20, the 2012 time frame, 2000, 2004 time frame. Um, this was some time ago, so I don't know that it would have contributed in any way to, to what happened in, ten, in 2022 or, or, or otherwise. Sorry. My, my, hold on, my information was, my information was that this, this incident uh, occurred outside Bear County, so we wouldn't have been able to use that to enhance sure. this to, to more serious offense. Sure, so when deputies do the type of checks when you said they were trying to de-escalate the situation, do they check for other weapons in the house, or were there other weapons or firearms in the house when you guys what? were there? I think typically we ask for ask for weapons. Since the the uh, homeowner was not suspected of any wrongdoing, I don't know that we would have gone searching or anything, uh, you know, absent consent. Uh, you know, but that's a typical question that we ask: Are there any weapons in the home? And on, on the key card, on the details, my understanding is we were told no weapons were seen, so there was no no reason for them to believe there was weapons involved. Now this is Texas; just about every house has at least a gun in it, so we always assume that there is one. But until we're told he had it, he's holding it, he brandished it, he threatened somebody, we just assume that it's, it's not in play at that moment. And clearly with him, again, they, I, I believe they could clean, clear, clearly see he was laying down, he was nude. Uh, I don't think they perceived a, an immediate threat, but they also, I don't think, wanted to initiate a violent confrontation when we may not have had the strongest authority to even burst into that room that would have gotten them into, into even more problems at that point. Is there any indication why he went to Austin and encountered any of the people that he killed there? So there is not, um, Joey. What my understanding is that a sibling lives in Austin, in the Austin area, but I don't know. Again, it'd be speculation for me to say he was going there for her. We don't know. Um, Austin may have a better understanding of, of what he was doing there. 
I don't know that there was any rhyme or reason to how he selected his victims uh, at all. Nothing, nothing that we've been made aware of. And my understanding was that last night he clammed up. He, was, he started an interview with them and then he clammed up. Uh, we had an investigator on the way to liaison with, with Austin. And then when, they, when he heard that the guy self-terminated the interview, he turned around and came back home. He figured he could do more help here. At a certain point, we may want to head out there and talk to him if he'll talk to us. But no, I don't. I don't know that there's any any motive established to why he was going there. Going back to the car, so is the car currently in somebody's custody? Was it found with them? But where is it right now? Yes, the car is in, in custody in Austin. It's impounded in Austin. No, pues nosotros ahorita es lo que estamos pidiendo al público, que si vecinos escucharon algo como balazos, si vieron algo, si escucharon un carro que iba a muy alta velocidad uh, huyendo de la, de la escena, nosotros quisiéramos que nos hablen a dos días tras tres, cinco, seis mil, o que nos manden email bcso tips at bear.org. So, entonces, desde ayer, que pues, agentes han estado ahí con los vecinos. No, nosotros estamos ahorita tocando en las puertas, preguntando si alguien dio algo, si tienen video, es lo que estamos haciendo ahorita, pero es posible también que nosotros tocamos una puerta, nadie estaba, estaba en el trabajo, pero ya que ven, van llegando a la casa y viendo las noticias, ojalá nos ven eso y, y nos hablen si, si tienen algo de información para ayudar. Chef, anoche usted dijo que todo aparentaba que los había matado y habían movido los cuartos a otro cuarto. ¿Sabe, sabe más de eso? ¿Los quería tal vez esconder? No, es, es lo que estamos, eh, estamos hablando. Mira, con, con una persona de, que está en crisis mental, hay, hay gran chance que nosotros nunca vamos a averiguar qué estaba pensando él en, en aquellos momentos. No se sabe. Si él habla con nosotros, obviamente le vamos a preguntar eso, pero también hay, hay gran chance que nosotros nunca vamos a, a, darnos, a, 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 a darnos cuenta qué es lo que pasó. Nosotros, siguiendo la evidencia que nosotros, nosotros tenemos, parece que los valió en un cuarto y los llevó al otro cuarto, uh, pero no se sabe cómo o por qué, y ojal, ojalá nos vayamos a dar cuenta en algún on, día. So the last time anybody spoke to one of the victims was 10 p.m., And then the first time somebody said they didn't see a car that should have been in the driveways was 9 a.m. So sometime between 10 p.m. and 9 a.m., we believe, is when the homicides occurred. Could have happened at 10.01 and then he took off to Austin. Uh, could have happened at 8.59 and then he took off to Austin because that would have allowed him plenty of time to get there and start shooting at people at around 10.30 or so. So sometime between 10 p.m. and 9 a.m. is the best we can narrow it down. And maybe we'll get it narrowed down if somebody can call us and say, hey, I heard something at 3 in the morning. We know that it was at least several gunshots from a large caliber handgun. So somebody may have heard something and, and woke up half, you know, half asleep, said, oh, it's just firecrackers. It's just those crazy kids next door or whatever. And they just wrote it off and didn't call. Again, we're asking you to try to remember. And if you heard something suspicious, call us. Where were the victims hit? Do you know? They were hit in the upper body. That's what I'll say at this point. Okay. Uh, no, we weren't able to. We have not yet been able to determine that. Thank you so much. Will Dupree back in the KXA Live studio bringing you that uh, live coverage of the news conference from the Bear County Sheriff and the Bear County District Attorney. Uh, they're talking about a double homicide that happened there yesterday. Uh, it is related to that uh, deadly shooting spree uh, that extended into Austin here. And six people are dead. Three others got hurt uh, in this Bear County situation. What they shared is that uh, deputies say they believe the two victims uh, killed there in San Antonio were the suspect's parents. And there had been some previous domestic violence situations uh, that the deputies had investigated. And they're also asking for people to uh, share information, any kind of uh, doorbell camera or surveillance footage they have maybe from their homes in that area. And if they have something that can assist with that, uh, to reach out to the Bear County Sheriff's Office uh, because this is a uh, expansive, large investigation that encompasses not just Bear County, but also now into Travis County. Uh, there is still much more to come there, uh, as well as official charges filed 
in uh, Bear County. However, we should note that that suspect, Shane James, who's 34 years old, is in custody here in Travis County at the jail on charges of multiple murder, charges rather of capital murder of multiple persons, excuse me. Uh, this again is the shooting spree suspect. Uh, more details about that shooting spree are available at our website, kxan.com. You can also tune in this evening for uh, further stories about what our comprehensive team coverage uncovered today. So once again, I'm Will Dupree in the KXAN Live Studio. Thank you all for watching here this afternoon. We appreciate that, and we'll see you back here at another time. Thank you guys so much for tuning into this week's episode of Who Killed the Presser of the Week. We know that this suspect is in custody and will not be harming anyone else outside of the penal system. So kudos to the officers for tracking this individual down. Unfortunately, there is a huge wake of destruction left behind. And unfortunately, these families will have to do a lot of uh, soul searching and a lot of uh, deep um, therapy to uh, deal with this type of a tragedy, especially when it's such a random incident. Uh, it's quite quite tragic so thanks for listening to this week's episode of the presser of the week again these are very insightful for anybody who's interested in journalism or interested in law enforcement because you can learn a lot by what the officers say and what they don't say in these press conferences so again thanks so much for tuning in as you know i drop new episodes of who killed every friday and occasionally who killed pressers of the week so check out the episodes i just dropped with author jesse p pollock about the long island serial killer it is very insightful and incredibly in-depth reporting on the shannon gilbert 911 call so check that out as well so thanks again and if you want to follow me on twitter you can do so at bill huffman three and until next time, as always, stay healthy and be safe. Are you tired of seeing your teen or young adult struggle on a path that clearly isn't the right fit? Is your teenager confused about which direction to take after high school? The future of work is changing rapidly. And our kids need to know all of the options available after high school so they're empowered to make the choice that is best for them. In each episode, we explore the latest trends that are shaping the opportunities of today and tomorrow. I'm your host, Betsy Jewell, and this is the High School Hamster Wheel Podcast. The crime was so brutal it was compared to the Manson murders. Mary and Bill, an Ohio cold case, explores what it takes to bring new attention to an unsolved double homicide and turns up new hope for answers. Listen to Mary and Bill, an Ohio cold case from Ideastream Public Media, wherever you get your podcasts.